Thank you, Peg. And thanks to everyone. Welcome. Is the sound okay? okay. Yes, you're fine. So once again, welcome to this Thursday night talk at Mountain Cloud. To be honest, when I realized our first talk of the new year would fall on January 6th, my first thought was how fitting. Today is what is called epiphany uh, by most Christian liturgical calendars. In that tradition, the epiphany of wisdom discovering unconditional love. Some of you know the story, three wise kings set out under the light of a bright star to find love incarnate. They come bearing gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts often associated with the preciousness of life, with the longings of the heart rising up like smoke from incense and the anointing of the dead. Gifts of wisdom, wisdom and compassion. One needn't identify with this story or its tradition to appreciate the resonance of epiphany. Look up the word, the ancient Greek epiphania, and you'll find the phrase, an experience of a sudden and striking realization. The words satori and awakening follow. And then this broader definition. The term is generally used to describe a scientific breakthrough or a religious or philosophical discovery, but it can apply in any situation in which an enlightening realization allows a problem or a situation to be understood from a new and deeper perspective. Epiphany, a light bulb goes on, like for Archimedes when sitting in a bathtub, he discovered the law of buoyancy and ran naked through the streets of Greece shouting, Eureka. Or maybe like us, when we suddenly discover the light that's been there all along. one shining entirety that cannot be extinguished. The greatest discovery of all. Turning toward this talk, encouraged by the light of epiphany, the shadow of this date suddenly dawned on me, January 6th. Along with the tradition of the Magi, multiple coronations of kings and queens over the centuries, laws and treaties signed, inventions patented, famous people born and dying and countless other historical events. This date for us is now infamous. The anniversary of the storming of the US Capitol. An uneasy day and a powerful reminder of the rift in our country, the great divide between what many are calling different realities, a divide that persists across our culture, 
more entrenched and virulent today than it was one year ago. What does our practice have to say to this? It says, sit, pay attention, ease your grip. It says, entrust yourself to this moment, empty, no knowing, no basis for judging. It says, open your heart, let it break all the way open. It says, hear the cries of the world as your very own cries. It sees the rifts in the world and says, this is my body. And it says, if a moment of unguarded opening comes, let yourself go and let the whole world come rushing in. As one student recently put it, one plus one equals one. The eighth century Zen master Sekito or Shitu put it this way, light and darkness are a pair like the foot before and the foot behind in walking. Light and darkness. One plus one equals one. Tonight, as a way of looking into this light and its hair in darkness, I'd like to return in what for me has been a fresh way to a koan Henry and I took up together at our winter solstice retreat in 2020. Solstice, that season of light and dark. So this is um, case 86 in the Blue Cliff Record, Unman's Bright Light. Here's the case. Unman giving instruction said, everyone has his or her own bright light. When you look at it, you can't see it. It is complete darkness. Now, what is the bright light of you all? He himself answered on behalf of the assembly. This is Unmun. The kitchen and the entrance gate. Again, he said, it would be better not to have even the best things. Okay, Unman. Unman or Yunmin the ninth to 10th century master who lived near the end of the Tang dynasty in a time of tremendous political turmoil and loss. 
out of that time, Unman gave us the koan, every day is a good day. Sekito's light and darkness resound every day. Here in this case, Unman is addressing his monks with the fundamental question, who are you? What is your own bright light? What is the bright light of you all? This is one and the same question. Your light, my light, the light of the insurrectionists scaling the walls of the Capitol. One light. What does it illumine? Over the holidays, my friend Maria Habito, who many of you know, gave me the gift of a book. It's a memoir by Jacques Luceran called, And There Was Light. Maria said it was the most important book she had read that year. I sat on our couch on December 26th and read it cover to cover. Lucerne was a bright, sensitive child, born myopic, you know, quite short-sighted, to what he describes as ideal parents. He had a happy childhood full of curiosity, discovery, and love. And then when he was seven, about to turn eight, there was an accident followed by surgery that left him blind in both eyes. Total darkness. He recovered quickly, as he put it, as children do. With the help of his parents, he quickly learned braille, but here's how he describes his real recovery. It was a great surprise to me to find myself blind. And being blind was not at all as I imagined it, nor was it as the people around me seemed to think it. They told me that to be blind meant not to see. Yet how was I to believe them when I saw? Not at once, I admit. Not in the days immediately after the operation, for at that time, I still wanted to use my eyes. I followed their usual path. I looked in the direction where I was in the habit of seeing before the accident the habit of seeing. He goes on, finally one day, I realized that I was looking in the wrong way. It was as simple as that. I was looking too far off and too much on the surface of things. This was much more than a simple discovery. It was a revelation. He describes going back to familiar places, writes, I even knew some of the trees in person, and naturally I wanted to see them again, but I couldn't. I threw myself forward into the substance, which was space, 
but which I didn't recognize because it no longer held anything familiar to me. Then, as he puts it, some instinct made him shift, step back, turn the light around. He writes, I began to look more closely, not at things, but at a world closer to myself, looking from an inner place to one further within, instead of clinging to the movement of sight toward the world outside. Immediately, the substance of the universe drew together, redefined and peopled itself anew. I was aware of a radiance emanating from a place I knew nothing about, but radiance was there. Or to put it more precisely, light. It was a fact, for light was there. I felt indescribable relief and happiness so great it almost made me laugh. The word fact just jumps out. And the great relief. Luceron goes on, without my eyes, light was much more stable than it had been with them. As I remember it, there were no longer the same differences between things lighted brightly, less brightly, or not at all. I saw the whole world in light, existing through it, and because of it. Shot through with light. It sounds like the Dharma, the great equalizer. Kohn Roshi called it a steamroller, this intrinsic equality and equanimity. And yet, each thing distinct. Whatever you pick up is all of it. Your own bright light. Lucerne let the light rise in him like a spring. But he also saw the distinction of things. Voices had color, trees had sound. He writes, how could I have lived all that time without realizing that everything in the world has a voice and speaks? The accident had thrown my head against the humming heart of things and the heart never stopped beating. The accident was brutal. Knocked over by another boy, knocked out, painful. Yet right there, the human heart of things, About sound, he writes, when the world sounds clear and on pitch, it is more harmonious than poets have ever known it or than they will ever be able to say. With sound, I never came to an end for this was another kind of infinity. One student recently sitting deeply on a cold day with the 
simple crackling sound of a down vest. Noticed attention wandering and the sound coming and going. But sitting in still absorption, she said, the sound never stopped. Lucerne's story goes through a similar account of awakening to touch, how his hands had to accustom themselves to freedom. Being blind, he writes, I thought I should have to go out to meet things, but I found that they came to meet me instead. He goes on to put it differently This means an end of living in front of things and the beginning of living with them. Never mind if the word sounds shocking, he writes, for this is love. Love with no opposite. Lucerne also writes about doubt and fear, how these reactions alone made the light diminish. And at the same time for him, how utterly disorienting they were, how out of place. But these experiences came with their own resolution. They didn't hold up. Describing his experience, he talks about how doubt and fear are not aligned with reality. And reality has a way of recalibrating. The light could dim now and then when he lost his compass, but it couldn't be snuffed out. He couldn't even make it go away. This reminded me of a time with Rian Roshi when we were sitting around in a group of teacher training and um, talking about practice. And I somewhat jokingly said, you know, sometimes I try to make this godness, this oneness world, you know, somehow change, you know, go away, uh, uh, divide. And, and I can't, it's not possible. It can't be other, no matter what I do. It is so. So I just want to share one more passage This is such a wonderful book. Um, This is about developing sight in a blind world. And it just, all the way through this, it it, uh, resonated and touched, you know, how this Zen world, this world of our practice, this invitation, these sort of touchstones of experience, these guideposts all along the way. So here is this last bit. It's soon after he loses his sight. As I walked along a country road bordered by trees, 
I could point to each one of the trees by the road, even if they were not spaced at regular intervals. I knew whether the trees were straight and tall, carrying their branches as a body carries its head, or gathered into thickets and partly covering the ground around them. To see them like this, I had to hold myself in a state so far removed from old habits that I couldn't keep it up for very long. I had to let the trees come toward me and not allow the slightest inclination to move toward them. Oh, I just hear Joshu now. <laughs> Should I turn toward it or not? Yeah. He goes on, you know, I, I couldn't afford to be impatient are proud of my accomplishment. After all, such a state is only what one commonly calls attention. When I became really attentive and did not oppose my own pressure to my surroundings, then trees and rocks came to me and printed their shape upon me like fingers leaving their impression in wax. And at practice, we often receive this instruction to sit and do as little as possible to let Mu come and get you. Let the whole world sit. When he was a young teenager, the Nazi occupation of France began and Lucerin became a French resistance organizer. He had this incredibly keen skill at discerning human character. So he would just one by one, you know, these close friends would bring someone that they thought might be, um, you know, in sync with them, might want to join this movement one at a time. And Lucerne would just have a conversation and he could tell. So together they built this network, a reliable group, quite large of young resistors. It helped that they were young because, you know, the police didn't pay so much attention. I mean, there were, for about 15 months, they organized, they found ways to hear the news that was completely forbidden, the real news. They stole paper and printed newspapers and distributed them up to 250,000 copies regularly. And then finally, one person turned and they were all betrayed. So there was a, there were 2000 from this French resistance movement were loaded into the train cars and taken to Buchenwald. And Lucerne was with them. After about a year and a half in 1945, when Buchenwald was liberated, 30 of those 2,000 had survived. What is the bright light of you all? 
when one asks. Does it include Hitler, Goebbels, the young French resistance members? The myriad others who died at Buchenwald? Does it include those who would dismantle systems of shared governance to secure power? Where could we draw the line? For Lucerne, it was this light that couldn't be snuffed out. All of it, this one light. This is my body. Everywhere you turn, every thought, every gesture, every sensation, your own bright light. <laughs> Suddenly like Helen Keller, I wanna run around, here it is, here it is, here it is. This one fabric. this reality of who I truly am. We may want to rush in with our question, so why can't I see it? Or how can I tolerate it? How can I survive it? Unmon drops right through the bottom of the barrel of that question. Here's what it is, complete darkness. In this one shining, every distinction, disappears. The world before our eyes disappears. Of course, no one's seeing, nothing to be seen. You know, all these words, vast and void, and yet so intimate. This darkness is what Zen calls true blindness. The wonder of not knowing and the fact of each thing being so utterly complete, we can't add anything to it, not even a word. How could we possibly see this one entirety wherever, whatever, whatever you pick up, that is your eye. Wherever you turn, without exclusion. Unman asks, what is the bright light of you all? And he answers on our behalf, the kitchen and the entrance gate. That's it, all of it, no escape, no remove. Then he adds one more line. Maybe for us, if we're tempted to say, and yet, or 
as we wonder how to respond in the face of so much suffering. Here's that last line again. Again, Unman said, it would be better not to have even the best things. First of all, what a teaching to offer this. And then in the last line, wipe it all away. Better not to have even the best things. And we don't. Empty hands. Boundless hearts breaking, meeting the moment at hand. Of course, finding what's ours to do. Of course, helping. This bright light is not something to attain. It's a description of what we already are. This one luminous blindness shot through with clarity and capacity and so entirely whole, there's nothing outside it and also nothing inside, not only one plus one equals one, but one plus one equals zero. Mm. So I'd like to close with an excerpt from a New Year's blessing by Karen Meisen Miller. This was in the latest uh, edition of Lion's Roar. Early on, she quotes Maizumi Roshi saying, it is impossible not to do your best. You just don't think it's your best. Then Miller writes, every moment arises pure and perfect from conditions as they are. From you as you are. She writes, judgment alone separates us from the fulfillment we think lies just beyond the precipice of time. The precipice of time. That's right here. That's this. Miller goes on to wish us, quote, Less of what we can live without, less anger and less quickness to anger, less greed and more open-mindedness, less judgment, doubt, and cynicism, and less of the pain and confusion they create, less hurry. Thank you, Henry, for your New Year's message. She goes on, less fear, more of the compassionate love that can only arise in the absence of fear. And she says, 
I would wish you more time, but you already have it. A moment of practice and everything everywhere is new again. Thank you so much for this shared practice. New each moment.